Hey, what's up you guys? Thanks for joining me. Today, we're going to be discussing a case that's a little different than what we normally talk about on this channel. It's far more controversial. As a disclaimer, I've been following this case for a while, but I wasn't going to cover it simply because people are so divided with their reactions. But several of you have requested it, and I've seen a lot of misinformation being spread. So here we are. I'm going to do my best to remain unbiased throughout the video, and I'll give my opinion at the end. But if I or someone else has a different opinion than yours, please do your best to remain respectful. With that being said, I'm going to give you the whole story. I want you all to be properly informed, and I don't want to give you half-truths or only tell you facts that are convenient to fit a certain narrative. I hope you'll hear all the facts before you decide how you feel. So, you know from the title, we're going to be discussing the case of Brooke Schuyler Richardson. So, starting from the beginning, Kim and Scott Richardson were married in 1996 and went on to have two children, a daughter named Brooke in March of 1999 and a son named Jackson about two years later. They were considered to be an all-American family. They lived in Carlisle, Ohio, which is a small town outside of Dayton. Kim worked as a human resources manager, and Scott was an accountant. They had some money in the bank, and they were considered a well-to-do family. Their daughter, who goes by her middle name Skylar, was a sweet and sensitive child that was always eager to please the people around her. She was a very attentive big sister, and was involved in many extracurricular activities at a young age. A few of those included gymnastics, softball, and cheerleading. She participated in those activities from elementary school on. She was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed cheerleader who was fairly popular through her school-age years. And she seemingly had everything going for her. But, as most of you know, things aren't always as they appear on the surface. By 12 years old, Skyler began dealing with some bullying from what I assume were catty middle school girls. While this was going on, Skyler turned to an older boy for some emotional support. Allegedly, this boy saw how vulnerable Skylar was at that point in her life and took advantage of this when he began sexually abusing her. I don't have all of the specific details of the abuse, but because of everything she was going through, Skylar began to struggle emotionally even more. She began to focus her attention on something she was able to control. Skylar had developed a pretty severe eating disorder and was suffering from both anorexia and bulimia. She would frequently binge and purge without her parents knowing, doing things like eating entire boxes of donuts, but then purging them directly after. She would frequently hide food in her room to avoid eating it and did not like to eat around her family. There came a point where Skylar was hesitant to chew gum or to even use toothpaste because she was concerned there were too many calories in them. Despite this, she pretty much always maintained a positive attitude. I guess you could say she put on a brave face for the people around her. And she was always there if someone needed her. At one point in high school, one of Skylar's classmates named Sheba was being bullied. When Skylar noticed how upset she was, she asked Sheba what was wrong, and this girl completely completely poured her heart out to Skylar. Sheba told Skylar that she wanted to die because she was ugly, and Skylar basically talked her off a ledge. She told her that she was the most beautiful person in the world, and that she had such a good heart and soul. And to this day, Sheba gives credit to Skylar for talking her out of suicide that day. On another occasion, Skylar discovered that one of her classmates was not going to be able to attend homecoming because she did not have the money for a dress. So she approached her mom and asked if they could donate money for a dress to the girl's teacher. One of her teachers would later go on to testify that he had noticed Skylar sitting with an autistic boy in the cafeteria because he was an outsider and no one else wanted to sit with him. Skylar saw that and didn't want him to eat alone. So she sat with him regardless what the other kids thought. When this boy didn't have money on his lunch account, Skylar would add her own money just so he could eat. So, leading up to this, it's clear that she had a lot of kindness and empathy for other people. She really cared. Outside of helping her classmates, Skylar had a busy high school career at Carlisle High. She was a cheerleader, which the media has loved to focus on. But I bet you haven't heard that she was also on the student council, volunteered at a soup kitchen, and taught cheerleading to children with disabilities. But the media likes to take a good headliner and run with it. 
And that's the tea. Outside of volunteer work, she also got a part-time job working at the YMCA. There, she would watch babies and small children while their parents worked out. Her co-workers often referred to her as the baby whisperer because babies would often warm right up to her. And she was able to easily calm them by rocking and singing to them. Despite all the positive things Skylar had going on in her life, her eating disorder and her appearance still ruled her entire existence. By the time she was 16 years old, Skylar only weighed 95 to 100 pounds and was struggling to keep it hidden from her family and friends. In fact, while at a cheerleading competition, Skylar nearly passed out due to malnourishment and exhaustion. And this was kind of a turning point for her and her family. Her brother Jackson would often hear her throwing up in the bathroom, and her aunt noticed that she would go into the bathroom, throw up, and walk out as if nothing happened. Skylar would continue her normal routine, and she acted like her normal and happy self. And again, that's because she didn't want anyone to be upset with her. Supposedly, her family began seeking treatment for her sometime in high school. However, I don't know how true that is, and you'll find out why I feel this way later in the video. Moving on, in the beginning of August of 2016, Skylar met a man on social media named Trey Johnson, and they began dating shortly after. The relationship was very short-lived though. They only dated for about a month when Skylar decided to end the relationship. She decided to do this because she knew Trey was going off to college, and she wanted to focus on her senior year of high school. The two of them were intimate twice in their brief relationship, apparently one time with protection and one time without. But nonetheless, when Skylar ended the relationship, she apparently blocked Trey from all social media, and the two never spoke again. Skylar then started her senior year of high school as planned and things were going great for her on the surface. In January of 2017, Skylar began dating a boy named Brandon, and he also attended Carlisle High School. He was a year younger than Skylar and was a very nice boy who appeared to really love her. He treated her with a lot of respect and she was happy. That's why a couple months later, in March of 2017, her family didn't say much when they noticed that she had gained some weight. They all went to Florida for spring break, and her Aunt Vanessa thought Skylar met this nice boy and now she's putting on some weight, which she desperately needed to do. Not one person suspected that just two months later, Skylar would be giving birth alone in her bathroom. The following month, Skylar had a doctor's appointment on April 26, 2017. She was going to see an OBGYN to get on birth control. Kim went to the appointment with her, but when Skylar was called back to the room, Kim stayed in the waiting room. Skylar was incredibly, incredibly nervous, which Kim marked up to it being her first OBGYN appointment. But little did she know, Skylar had a growing suspicion that she may be pregnant and was afraid that the doctor may tell her that. She had obviously noticed that she had been putting on weight and thought that maybe she even felt flutters. She was concerned about it to the point that she Googled, what happens at your first OBGYN appointment if you're pregnant? Either way, she convinced herself that it was nothing. She even had some bleeding a month prior to the appointment, which she believed was her menstrual period. So once she was in the room, she told the medical assistant that she had her period earlier that month. When the doctor came in, she told him that it was the month prior, which means that she would have had her period in March. Because there were some discrepancies, the doctor ordered a urine pregnancy test for Skylar, which she willingly consented to. As we all know now, the test came back positive. When Dr. Andrew came back in and alerted Skylar that she was pregnant, she had a very dramatic reaction. She began sobbing uncontrollably and told him that she could not have a baby right now. Though, she never really asked him if she had any other options. He told her that, quote, people would line up to raise her baby but he did not offer her any adoption options, nor did he advise her of any safe haven laws, which in the state of Ohio, safe haven laws allow parents to legally abandon their child within 30 days of the child's birth. A parent is legally permitted to voluntarily deliver a child to a police officer, hospital employee, or EMS, and they can do so without expressing any intent to return for that child. He did advise her though, if she was having any thoughts of harming herself or the baby, that she should call him immediately. Skylar consented to letting the doctor measure her stomach, at which time he recorded her fundal height at approximately 32 centimeters. 
Whatever the fundal height measures is approximately how many weeks old a fetus is, give or take one to two weeks. In most pregnancies, women obviously go to the doctor at the beginning of their pregnancy, which makes it much easier for a doctor to determine when the fetus was conceived based on measurements, which in turn makes it easier for a doctor to determine a due date and track a baby's growth process. If a fetus is measuring more than three to four weeks, smaller or larger than what they expect, that's cause for concern and further testing would be completed to make sure that the baby is growing the way that it should be. In Skylar's case, the doctor measured 32 centimeters and told her she would be delivering in approximately 10 weeks, not knowing that Skylar was actually 36 weeks along at the time. And the reason I'm going through all this with you guys is because Skylar was measuring approximately four weeks smaller, which can indicate that the baby's development is not progressing the way that it should be. But we will get back to that. So once the doctor measured her stomach, he wanted to do an ultrasound to make sure she was 32 weeks, like he said, and because he believed that it may help Skylar come to terms with her pregnancy. Again, the ultrasound indicated that she was approximately 32 weeks along, and the baby's heartbeat was 140 beats per minute, which is considered normal. So there was nothing alarming and nothing indicating that the baby was in distress. The doctor did not measure any of the baby's limbs at that time, and I believe did not even look at the anatomy because he wanted Skylar to schedule a follow-up appointment. He wanted her to come in for a more formal ultrasound in the next week. Skylar was still upset through all of this, but seemingly took the news okay. Dr. Andrews said that she reacted the way that most teen moms react, and she did ask him not to inform her mother. Another thing to note is that the birth control prescription that Skylar had came in for had already been called in prior to them determining that Skylar was pregnant, which apparently the office later tried to cancel, but called too late. When Skylar and Kim left the doctor's office, they immediately went and picked up the prescription. And Kim had no idea what had taken place at the doctor's office. Skylar began taking the birth control and ultimately told no one about her pregnancy. Not that I'm trying to defend that decision, but she was told that she had approximately 10 weeks before the delivery. And I think she needed to take some time to process the news. Not only that, she had two major events approaching that were very important to her at the time. The first being her senior prom, which was about a week away, as well as her high school graduation, which was in two to three weeks. So I imagine she didn't want to tell her parents before those things happened. Over the next week, the doctor's office called Skylar repeatedly. They wanted her to set up a follow-up appointment, but she did not answer, and they were unable to leave a voicemail because her voicemail account had never been set up. Apparently, they accidentally emailed her mother, at which time Kim immediately texted Skylar and asked her what was up. The email showed that she was pregnant, but Skylar told her mother that it was just a mistake. She said she would call about it later to figure out what happened, at which time Kim got really upset with her. Nonetheless, Kim let it go and they carried on as normal. Skylar and Brandon attended the Carlisle High Senior Prom on May 5th, 2017. So by this point, nine days after she found out she was pregnant. Here, you can see her in her prom dress, and I have to be honest, she does look round to me. I wouldn't say that she looks 36 weeks pregnant, but she does look like she could be three to four months pregnant, or I don't know, possibly had a food baby. I've seen many people saying that the Richardsons had to have known, but she really is not that large. And Skylar's family, boyfriend and friends, all tiptoed around the weight gain because of her eating disorder. They were careful not to bring it up. Well, you know, besides her mom, but we'll get to that. She and Brandon attended the prom and had a good time. Though Skylar was constantly asking her friends if she looked fat, and they all obviously told her no. Sometime throughout the evening, she also began to have severe stomach cramps, which she told Brandon were from her period. He did his best to comfort her, but they were very severe. The following day, Skylar felt worse as the day progressed. Brandon was so concerned that she didn't have a good time the night before that he texted her and asked her if she still liked him because she just wasn't being herself. She reassured him that everything was fine between them. She just didn't feel good. The Richardsons had planned to take Brandon to a Cincinnati Reds game for his birthday. Because he knew Skylar had not been feeling well the day prior, he asked her if she just wanted to skip the game. He said that they could just stay home instead. 
To which Skylar told him that they would absolutely not be skipping the game. But her cramps continued throughout the evening and were downright unbearable by that night. But everyone around her believed that she was just having intense period cramps. And little did they know that she was actually having full-blown labor pains. Around 3 a.m. on the morning of May 7th, 2017, Skylar was unable to sleep because of her cramps and felt as if she needed to use the restroom. She suddenly had a strong urge to push, at which time she delivered a baby into the toilet. She was in complete shock, apparently, because she had never been through labor before and claims that she didn't know what it would feel like. So she really wasn't expecting to deliver a baby. Skylar said that when the baby came out, she did her best to catch it, but the baby slid out and went into the toilet. She then picked it up out of the toilet, realized that she was a girl, and began cradling her and wrapping her in a towel. And it was at that time that she realized that the baby girl had kept her eyes closed and wasn't breathing. And she was also completely white. The baby never once cried, and Skylar tried to feel for a heartbeat, but was unable to locate one. She cleaned herself up and sat on the bathroom floor, holding her baby and sobbing for several hours. She then decided to name the baby Annabelle. Rather than dialing 911, Skylar says she then carried the baby downstairs to the garage and found a small shovel. She went into the backyard near the tree line, sat Annabelle down, and dug a small grave for her. She then took her out of the towel that she was in, placed her in the grave, and dropped pink rose petals that Brandon had given her a few days earlier. She also put a flower pot on top to sort of mark her grave, and at that point she went inside and cleaned everything up. Obviously many people believe that the baby was born alive, but no one in the house heard any of this happening. And Skylar's dog, that according to the family would bark at every little thing, never made a peep. Skylar's dad claims that the dog would have went nuts if it heard a baby cry. Aside from that, Jackson was sleeping in a bedroom that shared a wall with a bathroom, and he heard absolutely nothing. Skylar then went to sleep at approximately 5.30 a.m., and when she woke up later that morning, her behavior gets even more bizarre. Brandon had texted her, asking if she felt any better from the day before, to which she responded she would tell him about it later, and that, quote, last night was like the worst ever, but I feel so much better this morning. I'm happy. This gets twisted, but I think she meant that she was happy to be feeling better again. As in, happy she didn't have cramps anymore. I've obviously never been in labor before, but obviously anybody would be happy to be free of pain. Brandon then told her that he was sorry that he wasn't there for her, to which Skylar responded that she was glad it was over because it was very traumatic. She was scheduled to work that day, and she did end up showing up to her job like she was supposed to. Afterwards, working out at the YMCA, before texting her mom, I'm literally speechless with how happy I am. My belly is back. OMG, I am never, ever letting it get like this again. You're about to see me looking freaking better than before, OMG. Skylar told her mom that she was happy and proud, and that one of her teachers told her that she looked great, and asked her how much weight she had lost. When she told them 20 pounds, the teacher announced it to the class, and everyone clapped and cheered for her. To which Kim responded, I could cry. You are literally my hero. Skylar graduated in mid-May as planned. She graduated with honors and had been accepted to the University of Cincinnati, where she planned to study nursing or psychology. On July 1st, 2017, the OBGYN left Kim a message that Skylar was due for a follow-up. She told her to make an appointment, which Skylar did. She scheduled her appointment for July 12th and was supposed to see another doctor named Dr. Boyce. Skylar was unaware that Dr. Andrew had filled Dr. Boyce in on what had taken place on her first appointment. This time she went alone, and when she checked in for the appointment, Dr. Boyce asked her what she was there to follow up on, to which Skylar told her she needed a refill on her birth control. Obviously at that point, Dr. Boyce realized she did not have a baby with her and was no longer visibly pregnant. So she was kind of like, what happened to your baby? At that point, Skylar completely broke down. 
She was sobbing rather loudly to the point that other people in other rooms could hear her and told Dr. Boyce that she had given birth to the baby alone in her house. She said it was stillborn and buried it in the backyard. Dr. Boyce was obviously very concerned about Skylar. She offered to do a physical examination to make sure everything was okay and make sure Skylar didn't have any tears or infections, to which Skylar refused. She also told Skylar that she needed to seek counseling given the circumstances. Skylar said she would consider it, but begged Dr. Boyce not to tell anyone about her delivering the baby. Reluctantly, the doctor again called in the prescription for birth control and sent Skylar on her way. After Dr. Boyce consulted with Dr. Andrew, they decided they should call the police for that kind of situation. I will say, based on their testimonies, I don't think the doctors were calling the police to get Skylar in trouble. But because they were concerned about the baby being buried in the backyard, and due to doctor-patient confidentiality and Skylar being over the age of 18, they were unable to contact her parents. They really seemed concerned. Over the next couple of days, Skylar still did not come clean about what had happened to anyone besides Dr. Boyce. But little did she know, her secret was about to be exposed to every single person in her life. On July 14th, investigators showed up at the Richardson home. It was evident that no one was home at the time, but shortly after, Scott pulled into the driveway, unaware of why the police were standing at his front door. Detective Fain, with the Warren County Sheriff's Office, told Scott that they were doing an investigation and that they needed to speak with Skylar because of something that she may have witnessed. He also told him that she was not in any trouble. Skylar was over at her grandma's house with her cousin swimming. Scott called her and told her to get home immediately. Once she arrived, she and Scott drove down to the Carlisle Police Department so that they could interview Skylar. At that point in time, Scott asked if they needed an attorney, and Detective Fain told them that they didn't because she was not in any trouble and that the questions would just be routine. Obviously, at that point in time, Skylar was shitting her pants because she knew exactly why she was there, and it didn't take much for her to confess to everything. The detectives told her that they had been given a tip that she had given birth and buried her stillborn baby in the backyard of their home. I've watched through the entire interview that's been made public, and her first interview seemed very honest to me. Her story matched what she told Dr. Boyce, that she delivered her baby in the bathroom in the early morning of May 7th, her baby was stillborn, and she was scared to tell her parents, so she buried the baby's body in her backyard. You could tell that Skylar had a genuine reaction. She was very nervous to be in a police interrogation room, like any of us would be if we hadn't buried our baby in a backyard and she became very upset when she told them what happened. They told her that they imagined it would be very painful and traumatic, to which Skylar sobbed even harder. We, we got a call, the reading today, we got a call from the doctor's office. Okay, so are you familiar with what doctor's office with the OBGYN? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll just share with you the information you know that they, they gave us. Um, I'm going to say these dates, but I can't say for sure these are the exact dates, but they're the dates that they gave us, okay? So we're just going off the, the information they gave us. And according to them, on April 26th, you went to a doctor's appointment. Does that sound right? Okay. Um, and also, according to them, that day you found out you were pregnant. Okay, is that true? Okay. Um, and do you, tell me about, how did you make that doctor's, I mean, or did you just want to go to the doctor? Did you want to get on birth control? Yeah, what was the, birth control. Okay. Did you make an appointment yourself or did you my, talk to your mom? My mom helped me make it. Okay, your mom helped you make it. Did she go with you? <laughs> she did go with you. Okay, did she find out that day that you were pregnant? I didn't tell either my parents. She didn't. And since you were 18, the medical staff wasn't required, yeah. required to tell her. Um, and if I got information right from the doctors, they maybe did an ultrasound? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. and did they tell you how far pregnant you were, how many weeks? I'll be completely honest, I didn't listen. Okay. I didn't hear. I don't you didn't know hear? Or, I was. Okay. Um, could, could they have told you 32 weeks or maybe they could? Maybe. I know I okay. was far along. And you, was probably, you know you were far along. You, um, was it a shock to you? It, it was kind of. I, okay. Cause my then, parents, I... Reason, reason I asked that is because um, they, they said you didn't know you were pregnant, even though you were that far along, you didn't know. Did you have some suspicion? Or? Yeah, I just didn't want to, like, I didn't want to let myself know. I uh, understand. I understand that you're, you're 18. Um, um, How did you know you might be? Or what made you think you might be? I was really big. 
I was pretty big. I okay, you were getting the belly. Could you feel your baby? Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Because, I, I, I mean, at 30, let's say it was 32 weeks, like, they're you could feel it. pretty active, right? I mean, obviously, I didn't feel it, but I've seen, and my wife had seen, um, and you probably, I'm going to guess, hadn't had a period in mm -hmm. several months. But um, before that, I was a little irregular with my period, so I okay. tried to think that, that maybe it was normal. I think maybe that was it until you started. Well, and then when you could feel, um, so when you, let me go back a little bit now, when you were making the appointment, even though your mom didn't know this, were you kind of wanting to find out if you were pregnant or confirm just, if you were? Yeah, I just, like, I had a feeling that that would be what they told me and stuff. I just, I didn't, I was lost, and I, my parents, they're going to be so mad at me. You find out, they, they confirm that you are pregnant. Um, What goes through your mind? My parents are going to kill me. I didn't, like, want to tell them. I didn't, like, want to tell them at all. I still don't really want to tell them, but now they're going to know. Um, okay. They'll probably be very disappointed in me. So what do they do at the doctor's office? What do they tell you? I mean, they tell you you're pregnant, but do they do they want to talk to your mom or anything, or do they want you to tell your mom? Yeah, what is, I think they wanted, they wanted me to tell my mom, but I did not want to tell her. Uh huh. You didn't want to, and did you tell them that that was your wish? You don't want them yeah. to tell. And you're, you were 18, so they had to go by. You know, it's not like you were a minor or anything. You're an adult now. Um, did you tell say anything to them about it or ask them about any options or anything you could do or yeah, what you should I do? I didn't, I didn't really want to have my baby, but I didn't get rid of it. Um, I didn't really know what I should do. Um, I never called the place back or anything to see what Which I place, the doctor? The doctor. I never called them back to make another appointment. Okay. But they wanted me to, but I didn't because I was scared. Okay. Um, I understand understand that too. Let's jump ahead now to let's jump ahead to this week, to Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? Yes. You went back to that doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the purpose of that visit? To check back up on my birth control, uh -huh. um, and I told her what had happened. Okay, you told them what happened. Um, okay, what did you tell them happened? That I had to have a baby, and it wasn't alive. Okay. Um. I didn't kill the doll. Oh, we're, 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 not, we're not saying anything like that. That's not why you're here today. We're not saying that. Um, did you say her? Okay, it was a girl. Um, so, so what did you tell, tell them? So you, you had you told them you had to have the baby and she wasn't alive. Um, did you know what date that it happened on? May 7th. It was for sure. Okay, because that's the date they told us, but I didn't. I just want to make sure the information they gave us was the same, okay? Um, and I'm sure you remember for sure because it's a horrible day. I'm just going to assume it was a horrible day. Um, Let's, um, so now, and, th and this is probably hard, but, but again, we're just, um, we're just trying to get this, you know, and it kind of gives you a chance, you a chance also to. Am I in trouble? To, what's that? Am I in trouble? No, I, we're just, we're just trying to figure out, Scott, what, the whole reason we're here today is just try to figure out, um, just like on May 7th, what, what happened in February, are you, are you okay, and what, the information we got from the doctor, so let's, um, let's go to May 7th that day, and, um, Tell us about, and, and try to make sure we can hear you on here, but tell us about what happened. Kind of walk us through exactly what happened, you know, what you what you felt or where you were, and just kind of tell us what happened. I, I had the baby, and I didn't, I mean, I... Okay, hold on a second. When you say you had the baby, where were you? I was in my bathroom. You were in your bathroom? Okay, were you on the toilet or in the bathtub or on the, the floor? Toilet. Were you seated on the toilet? Yeah, and that's when I had the baby. Okay, how did you, um, how did you know you were going to have her? Did you have I any... I could feel it, and something needed to come out. I could feel it. So you felt that feeling? Yeah. Um, do you know, have you ever heard the term when people say their water broke? Yeah, I don't think, I don't but know. But you didn't that. I don't feel know. that. Well, and you would, I think you'd probably I don't know. I think it. it just came out um, okay. when I pushed and it was breathing. Um, it didn't make any noises. Okay. Um, so you're, you're seated on the toilet and I guess, and, and I'm just, mm -hmm. just trying to visualize. So do you have your hands? Are you going to try to catch her? I'm trying. I'm breathing. Okay. So when she. I assume because you were able to deliver there by yourself. She wasn't breached or anything else, so she came out head first. Is that right? I think. I just think I know what happened. You just kind of came out and I tried. I tried. Okay. No, and I, I understand. I understand. When when she came out, did were you able to catch her? Did she go into the toilet or were you kind of yeah, a little? I kind of caught her by the head a little bit. Caught her by the head? Okay. And so when you say a little, are, are you... Are you holding her head and like maybe feet or something are hanging down into the toilet or how? Okay. Well, and it's probably hard to remember exact details, and I'm just trying to I'm just trying to visualize it. And there will be things that you can't specifically remember because it's traumatic and it's not your fault. You know. I never that you can't. Her. I, I understand that no one here no one here thinks that you did, Skylar. There's we're not judging you. Where we think you are. A scared 18-year-old, you know, girl who, even though 18 is when you're an adult, you know, it's 
said, I've had kids a long time, so you're still a very young woman at 18 years old, and you're going through this alone because, had you told anyone yet? Okay, so. I've never told anybody. Yeah, see, that's what I mean. So you're, you're doing this all on your own. You've got no help. So it's going to be overwhelming. I mean, I wouldn't expect it any other way. So let's go back, and you're holding her, so, and maybe she's probably hanging down. So what do you, what do you do next? Put her in my arms like her, I don't want her. She's breathing. She doesn't have a heartbeat. She's not breathing. Um, how did you, how did you, I know the breathing part, you can kind of tell and see, did you ever, did you ever hear a cry or a whimper? Um, did you, um, when you say she didn't have a heartbeat, did you try to check it? I tried to feel, I tried, I hope tried I to feel in her chest. I need to push hard, I just felt. Okay. Um, and did you, were her eyes open or closed? They were closed. They, they were closed. Right. Okay. Um, can you remember whether or not she still had the umbilical cord attached to her I belly button? I don't remember. I can't remember. Like, okay. Un I'm sorry. Under understand. Um, so now you're, you're holding her in her lap, is that correct? Do you have a towel or anything, or is she just on your legs? There was a towel. I had a towel, and I was bleeding so much. In my opinion, it seemed like it felt good to finally tell the truth. Like a weight had been lifted because she had been hiding this and living with it for months. And Skylar could not shut up even when it was in her best interest. The police repeatedly told her they were not judging her. Detective Fane told her about how his daughter had gotten pregnant young and considered an abortion. You know, to make himself relatable and look like a caring dad figure, right? Meanwhile, he was just trying to build the prosecution's case. Once she told them what had happened, they took her back to her home without her parents' knowledge, and she took them to directly where she had buried the baby. Not once did she deny what she did was wrong. She told them everything from the get-go. When the three of them got back to the police station, Skylar was then faced with telling her parents what had happened. She repeatedly asked the detectives if her parents were gonna be mad and if they would still love her. But the interaction that Skylar had with her parents is so bizarre to me. When they walk in, Skylar immediately reaches out to her mom, lets out a sob, where Kim half-assed hugged her daughter, and then sat across the table from her. Less than 60 seconds after they walked into the room, Kim was telling her terrified daughter that she's going to jail. She didn't ask her if she killed the baby, or why she would bury the baby, or if she was okay. The next thing Kim says, and again, is within 60 seconds of being in the room, is, I thought we had a perfect life. Scott seemed to have a more genuine reaction. He asked questions and he seemed like he's in utter shock. And then Skylar tells her parents that she knows she lied about the pregnancy, but that she didn't hurt her baby. She later goes on to say that she never meant to hurt her baby. Kim then goes on to bitch about how it's gonna be on the news. How do you think so-and-so is going to feel about this? She then says, How do you think I feel? Skylar asked her mother, You have to believe me. Why can't you just support me? I just feel like their reactions are very telling on their family dynamic. 
Her dad was even scolding her to some degree, and she was worried about her mommy loving her. It just gives you more insight on what Skylar was dealing with. Meanwhile, things at the Richardson house were getting even crazier. The media was everywhere as police were searching the house, and literal crowds were forming. Carlisle is a small town where nothing ever happened, so this news was huge, and the rumor spread like wildfire. People were lining up to get a piece of the action. They were coming and sitting in front of the house with camping chairs. After the first interview on July 14th, the police allowed Skylar to go home with her parents. They were still trying to sort everything out, they were still collecting evidence, and still trying to build their case, so Skylar was not formally charged with anything at that point. When they returned home that night, there were still crowds formed around their home, and the media lights were so bright that there was no way they'd be able to sleep there. And ultimately, they ended up going and staying at a hotel that night. The Warren County Sheriff's Office issued a statement that they had found skeletal remains near the Richardson's home, and they believed they were from a stillborn baby. They dusted and were able to find the majority of the baby's remains. However, because two months had passed, she was already severely decomposed, which investigators knew would make their jobs a lot harder. Decomposition would make it nearly impossible to determine the baby's cause of death. But just a few days later, investigators believed that they had caught a break in the case. One of the forensic pathologists working the case noticed what appeared to be slight charring on the baby's rib bones, which ultimately had led investigators to believe that Skylar had given birth to a live baby and then purposely ended her life, ultimately setting her on fire, causing the charred bones. They collected soil from the grave and tested it, as well as the baby's remains for any use of an accelerant, which ultimately they found no evidence of. At that point, they brought Skylar in again for a second interview. Detective Fain, again, pretended he was on Skylar's side. The other officer sat holding Skylar's hands for a while, comforting her, telling her that they're not judging her, and that they just wanted to get to the bottom of things to find a resolution. Skylar again talked to investigators without an attorney present. Leading up to the more serious questions, Detective Fane mentioned things like how her parents are asking for the baby's remains so that they can give her a proper burial. And he knew that Skylar wanted that because Skylar said that she knew Annabelle deserved better. And he could not stop thinking about how they couldn't release her remains until the case was resolved and they had all the information. Detective Fane then told Skylar that the doctors had been working with Annabelle's remains for lots and lots of hours, tiny bone by tiny bone. They then started to paint a narrative that's a bit more descriptive than what Skylar told them previously. They asked her what color the baby was when the baby came out. They asked her, was the cord wrapped around her neck? Did she fall into the toilet? So she agrees with everything they're saying until they ask, how long was she in the toilet? Which Skylar doesn't have an answer to until the female detective says, five minutes, two minutes. Skylar says that she doesn't remember, but maybe two minutes. Only after the detective suggested it. Shortly after that, she said, tell me about the fire. To which Skylar responds with utter confusion and shock immediately stating that she never burned her, and she was adamant about it, going on to say that she did nothing with fire, nothing. She tells them that she never burned the baby repeatedly, until Detective Fane says they have scientific evidence that the baby was burned, because of the forensic pathologist's findings. So you're the only one that can tell us that she can, okay? So you need to do the right thing right now and just tell us everything that happened, even if it sucks to say it, just tell us everything that happened and we can move on, okay? You know, and Brandy and I, we, we talk to so many people that after the fact, you know, they're like, that feeling once they finally tell the truth and then get it out, because I bet it has probably bothered you some, because I can tell that you care. It bothered you some since Friday, since we talked, you know, since I, you knew I didn't get the truth, and um, you still had to carry that, you know, carry that weight with you. So like, like Brandy said, um, let's start there. So now you have picked her out from the toilet and you wrapped her in a towel and, and held her easily. And, um, and just be truthful now, let's go from there and, and go with the rest Listen, you said, you, said, you said something really interesting. You said, I think maybe I held her too tight. Tell me what that means. I, I did think she was breathing and I think I squeezed her too hard. Okay. But it was because I I know. It's okay. I squeezed her. It's okay. You can't. It's okay. You were trying. I think that was killed her. Okay. Okay. You yeah, I think okay. I killed her. <laughs> I think I killed her all first. I, I, no one said, 
Skyler, no one believes that. This queen is so good. I love her. No one believes that you would do anything to her on purpose. No one believes that. Okay? I'm getting a stupid Honey. Wait. Sweetheart, we are just... Those are not questions still, we can answer yeah, for you right we're now. In the same, we're in the same place. We just are still, um, you know, you're talking about a lot of the different stuff that the doc. So we're just still, we're just still trying to do right by her. We're so focused, like Brandy said, it's not me or you or, uh -huh. or, or you Brandy that's important. What's her name? Annabelle. Annabelle. Okay, so Annabelle. it's not calling her Annabelle? Okay. All right, so it's about Annabelle, okay? You can't change, you can't go back and change anything. I don't have a magic wand, okay? I'm so sorry. Just, let's just keep talking about what happened and then it'll all be out and we'll be done, okay? Can I go over my head? That, I can't answer that for you right now, okay? Well, I don't know what'll happen. I haven't finished talking to you, okay? All right, so you you think you squeezed her too hard, so she... And I, I feel like when you say that, maybe you thought she was breathing before and you didn't mean to. I don't think you meant to, but you squeezed her too hard. Okay. How long do you think you were squeezing her?
so there can be a, a real, you know, true burial where she's honored. And like you said the other day, you were, you're crying hard for you're like, she deserves better, she deserves better. You're right, she does, and she's about to get, you know, she's about to get better, like she, like she deserves better. Better than being in a lab with doctors, you know, just searching and sifting and, and poking and everything, you know, now we, we're getting the food from you so we can be done with, with all that. And, um, can you, so how, how big would you describe the fire? Would you say big? Would you say small? Was it tall? Was how it looked like? Yeah. How far did it go? Like, was it like shin? I know baby legs are super little, but like, was it like this much? Like, you know, if you want to use your like your forearm, was it like this far up? Was it this far up? Do you know how far up the, the fire went? Okay. What about to her like chest area, stomach? What made you decide you wanted to get it out? Well, just was she moving at that point or no, making any no. okay. so there, there wasn't any noise or anything, it was just a, okay. Um right. so when you when you tried to get it out, what did you do? How did you try to put it out? You didn't get far, did you? No. Did you get it out? Did you Just like she would like try to get the flames, the flames down, or? Yeah, you did it all quickly. Okay, and just try to do it quickly, like you, you change your mind, you said it felt long, so you, you try to change your mind, and okay, which, which we understand, and I can see that being a, a natural reaction. Um, you didn't feel like it was right for. Was it, were you successful? I mean, once you were doing that, were you able to put the fire out? Or did you have to do, did you have to go get water or anything to help you? Because a lot of times it's hard to get the fire out even with just dirt. Mm -hmm. Were you able to get it out before it reached your face? Maybe. How long, let me just ask you this, because I know cremation took a while. How long do you think, um, once you kind of started the fire, how long do you think that it went on before you put it out? Like 10, 20, 30 minutes? I know you're out there in the dark and I'm probably still in shock a little bit and all of that, but. And not exactly, even you won't know exactly. It's a minute, two minutes, 45 seconds, three minutes, just. Three minutes. <laughs> So at some point, let, let me ask you this, what made you, I know you said you thought it was wrong, what made you, okay, I gotta put this out, was it Was it some other thought, like, uh, was it as it was getting closer to her face, or was it just, you know, the smell, or was, was there another thing that just kind of made you realize I shouldn't do this? Mm -hmm. You just felt like it was wrong. What about, um, what about where you not concerned? I mean, just because like it, it's a beautiful place where you live, and, and I know it's kind of big, but it's open. What about someone seeing it? Were you worried about someone seeing a fire back there at that time of the night? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I understand why I asked that because that that would be understandable if that was if that was true. You know, because that's obviously that's why it's early. If it was dark, that's going to draw attention, and it's going to make you worry about about someone coming out and um, which if you feel like you're maybe doing something wrong, you know, you're not going to want someone to walk out and um, so you're able, you're able to get all the flames out, right? Or you were able to do that? Okay. And just by, are, are you sure you didn't use anything, any water or anything or you just got them out by using dirt? Okay. Using the dirt. Um, what do you do next? This, but I, I know you were so sincere. Like one thing's kind of, I mean, we, we talked to so many people and if you could see yourself from across here, there's certain things when you do, like when you got to that part, just your facial expression was so different. You were so sincere, like you truly felt awful, like you did something, but you knew you didn't do it on purpose. So those feelings were genuine. But what that also tells me for 100% sure, I know 
that somehow you know she was alive like before that, and that's why you're worried you didn't do something that could have helped. Why did she make a noise? Make a noise? What, what kind of noise? Maybe a little noise, a girl, but I didn't know if it was something else. Like a, uh-huh. And then I didn't hear another one. And then another one? Okay, which is, which is natural because that's what, I mean, again, I'm not a mom, but I've been in the delivery room for, for four of them, and there's, there's like kind of a, a gurgle sound, and the doctors will suction out, you know, that stuff. Uh, I'm sorry? Can I get you again? Okay. Was that, like, when she was in the toilet, or was that when you were sleeping? I think. that was when she was in the toilet. So you heard, like, one gurgle, and then not, not another sound? I thought she said that you thought you heard maybe one more gurgle. No, I said I didn't hear Oh, you didn't hear Just the one. Okay. What else, um, what else made you think that at first she was alive? Besides the gurgle sound, um, tell us about, because one thing babies will do is I know, um, even as they're getting ready to do that suction, like the second when they first come out, you know, they're, like their arms, sometimes they're kind of like this, or they'll, they don't know what might have moved, but I didn't look right away. I was like, Shock, I don't. I understand. Yeah, a baby just fell out of here. I mean, but that would, that would be shocking. Shock you're doing you. this by yourself. Skylar denied burning Annabelle 17 times, stating, I didn't kill her. I didn't kill my baby. After the 30th time, and Detective Fane saying, Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, Skylar said, Maybe I killed her a little. Once they began suggesting that Skylar tried to cremate her baby, she eventually caved. They told her again that they wanted to release her baby's remains to her dad, and they couldn't stop thinking about the fact that they had to keep her remains from him. They told her that cremating her baby was okay and completely normal. They were asking her for questions that she did not have answers to. You can see her repeatedly trying to search for the answer to give them. She was trying to give them the right answer. When she was telling the truth, she had an answer immediately. But when they were coercing her, and she wasn't sure what to say, she would pause for a minute before telling them exactly what they wanted to hear. They told her that she needed to tell her parents. So they brought them into the room again, and there's four adults hovering around her while she confessed to burning her baby a little to her parents, which we now know never, ever happened. It was at that point that Skylar was arrested and charged with aggravated murder, involuntary manslaughter, gross abuse of a corpse, tampering with evidence, and child endangerment. From that point forward, the majority of Carlisle wholeheartedly believed that Skylar murdered Annabelle given the evidence that she burned her remains. Shortly after Skylar's arrest, the forensic pathologist decided to take a look at the baby's remains again, and she noticed they were different in appearance from the first time she examined them. The charring on the ends of her bones was no longer present, which is obviously not possible if they were truly burned. The doctor determined that the charring was actually from the bones being wet the first time they were examined, from being in the ground, where they were buried. She recanted her statement about the remains, which really pissed the prosecution off, because that was their entire case against Skylar. Annabelle's cause of death was considered to be inconclusive. By that point, Judge Donald Oda had already put a gag order into place, so Skylar's attorneys were not able to make a statement about what the pathologist had determined. So until her trial, two years later, everyone believed she had burned her baby. Skylar was eventually bonded out and was placed on house arrest where she remained for the next two years. At some point, the judge allowed Skylar to leave her home, but enforced a strict 9 p.m. curfew so that she could go out and apply for jobs and do things like go for walks around her neighborhood. However, the residents of Carlisle were not having it. Anytime Skylar would leave the house, people would spit at her, scream obscenities, call her a baby killer. She tried to apply for 40 jobs around Carlisle and was never called back and the media continued to have a field day with her case. If you type in Brooke Schuyler Richardson into YouTube right now, people will be referring to her as the cheerleader who buried her baby, or something of that nature. It's been a headline that has gained national attention, and everyone has an opinion about this case. One person in particular has taken it so far that she has been literally stalking the Richardson family for two years. I'm not going to name any names, but let me just put it like this. This person created a Facebook group called Justice for Annabelle, which usually is great. I frequently join groups like this to connect with families and show my support. 
and so that I can stay up to date with cases that I cover. There's nothing wrong with these groups. However, the creator of this particular group is a nasty middle-aged Carlisle resident who has taken it upon themselves to sit outside the Richardson's home taking photos of their comings and goings so they can report it back to other people in the group and bash the Richardson's. I completely do not agree with this. Firstly, there's the aspect of being innocent until proven guilty, but more importantly, Skylar's mom, dad, and younger brother, who was still a minor at the time, still live there and have not committed any crimes. And I personally believe that they deserve privacy while they grieve the loss of their granddaughter and niece and the possibility of losing their daughter to the prison system. You could agree to disagree with me on that, but I find it highly disrespectful and disgusting that this person stalked the family during this for a fucking Facebook group. Skylar's trial began on September 4th, 2019, which like I said earlier, I watched in its entirety. I'm just gonna put this out there. The prosecution failed to prove its case from the very beginning. It was a very emotional trial, and something that Skylar's attorney said during the closing arguments really stood out to me. He said that the prosecution has attempted to poke holes in the defense's argument, which is the exact opposite of how trials usually go. Normally, when a case goes to trial, defense attorneys do anything and everything they can to prove that the evidence is not accurate. Why? Because they want to create reasonable doubt within the jury. In this case, it was the prosecution that was trying to create reasonable doubt and the evidence that the defense had, proving Skyler innocent. Do you see why that's problematic? We know that Skyler falsely confessed to some degree, given that she eventually admitted to burning her baby, which was simply not true. If you remove the second police interview from the equation, the evidence that Skyler murdered Annabelle is circumstantial at best. There are some things that I want to talk about from the trial that I feel a lot of people are either glossing over or simply do not know about. There was a lot of talk about interuterine growth restriction throughout the trial. And for those of you that don't know what that is, the definition is a condition in which a baby doesn't grow to normal weight during pregnancy. And there are a few things that can cause IUGR. The most common cause is an issue with the placenta, which is what carries oxygen and nutrients to the baby. There are other contributing things like diabetes, infections, malnutrition, smoking, drinking, etc. Dr. Andrew testified when he measured Skylar's stomach, she was 32 centimeters, which means that Skylar was measuring at approximately 32 weeks along, give or take one to two weeks. While it is possible to have a small baby, a fetus measuring three to four weeks smaller than what it should be could indicate there's an issue with its growth, which would be a cause for concern. We now know that Skylar was more like 36 to 40 weeks along because she delivered only 11 days later. Because Skylar had not received prenatal care prior, Dr. Andrew was not aware that she was measuring smaller than what she should have been. She had somewhat of a belly, which you can see in prom photos, but the people around her didn't even know she was pregnant at all. At 40 weeks, nine months, I'm a dad. I've been up close and personal to pregnancy, and I know that at nine months pregnant, the majority of people, no matter how small or large, are waddling around and miserable by that point. Skylar looked very, very small. Another symptom of IUGR is that the baby may be small or look malnourished. The umbilical cord is typically thin and dull rather than thick and shiny. And I personally feel that this lines up with how Skylar describes Annabelle, aside from how she described her size. During the interrogation, they asked her if the baby appeared to be healthy, to which she responded she was kind of big. The prosecution pointed out that Skylar had worked with babies at the YMCA and knows the approximate size of a newborn. While I agree, she delivered into a small toilet. And I don't know about you, but if a whole ass human came out of me, I'd be wigged out about the size as well. To me, her telling the detectives that the baby is kind of big is more of her opinion than a fact. What is more telling to me is that she describes the baby as being white when she was born which indicates that she could have been deprived of oxygen, which is common with IUGR. She talks about how she didn't have to cut the umbilical cord and at one point thinks it could have been disconnected from Annabelle. We also know that though Skylar suspected that she could have been pregnant, she did have spotting the month before delivering, which can indicate an issue as well. Though Dr. Andrew listened to the baby's heartbeat and the ultrasound, he testified that her heartbeat would have been the last thing to show any signs of a problem. 
As we know, Skylar suffered from a very severe eating disorder. She had no prenatal care during her pregnancy and would frequently skip meals and get rid of them, if you know what I mean. There is text message proof that her and her mother were abusing the laxative Dokalax throughout Skylar's pregnancy. According to AmericanPregnancy.org, there are many complications that are associated with eating disorders during pregnancy, including premature labor, low birth weight, stillbirth or fetal death, delayed fetal growth, respiratory problems, complications during labor, depression, miscarriage, and the list goes on. It's not far-fetched to consider that Annabelle was stillborn. While I do think it's coincidental that Skylar was concealing her pregnancy and clearly did not want to have a child and then was lucky enough to have a stillborn, stillbirth is still likely, in my opinion, given what we know. A psychologist that studied police interrogations and false confessions testified that he believed that Skylar had been coerced and had a personality disorder that made her more susceptible to give in to authority figures and tell people what they wanted to hear. I personally find this to be likely as well. She was known to be a people pleaser to virtually anyone around her. Her family, her friends, her teachers. And if you look at the messages between Kim and Skylar, it's very evident to me that no matter what, she wanted to make people happy and for them to approve of her. It didn't matter how much it hurt her, she was always willing to do and say the right things. The defense discredited every piece of evidence the prosecution had, and ultimately, they just failed to make their case. There was nothing that the prosecution presented in this trial that made me stop and say, oh my god, she did this. Outside of the act of burying her baby, which she admitted to right away to numerous people, and the jury felt the same. The trial lasted a week, and on September 12th, 2019, the jury came back with a not guilty verdict on all counts, aside from the abuse of a corpse charge, which the judge ultimately sentenced Skylar to three years of probation and seven days in jail which she was credited with time served. When the jury came back with not guilty, Skyla was sobbing and visibly shaking. Judge Oda finally released Annabelle's remains after two years to the Richardson family, and they're going to give her a proper memorial and burial. He did so only under the circumstance that the baby's paternal side of the family would have access to her as well. Trey Johnson's mother made a statement to the court to take into consideration prior to Skylar's sentencing. And I want to insert it here because they are victims in this as well. Two years, four months, one week. In case you were wondering, that's how old my granddaughter would be if she were here today. And as hard as I've tried to find the right word to describe, broken, shattered, destroyed, none of them seem to fit the amount of pain I have felt ever since we found out that not only did I lose my first grandchild, but my baby that I would lay down my life for without a thought, lost his first child, and Skyler had no intention of ever letting us know. I found out from watching her interviews with detectives and her parents that not only did she know from the very beginning that Trey was the father, but also that she tried to secure her remains and planned on burying her without any of us ever knowing. As I've, and I've been told that the family is now trying to do it again as if we don't exist. But for a baby that she called it, many times we're just as much her family as Skylar is. She seemed perfectly okay with asking Tori, Trey's cousin, just a three month age difference and more like a sister to be a character witness for her without giving her a few bits of crucial information, such as the baby being Tori's cousin. And yet she had no issue destroying and dividing an entire extended family. We at that point didn't think we could trust anyone if we couldn't trust the family that was the absolute closest person to Trey. It was almost a year before I sat down with Tori and found out that she had been lied to. I don't know if you know how we originally heard that Trey was the father. He had a DNA test on August 6, 2017. Then on January 29, 2018, a Facebook page named him as the father because of a subpoena issue. My phone started blowing up while I was at work around 10 p.m. And then I headed to the prosecutor's office the next morning on January 30, 2018. Got a phone call from Trey while I was on my way here there was a news van outside of our house. He couldn't come in 
when he got home from class. So I turned around to go home and protect my baby because I will always protect my baby first. Then he called back, told me they had left a card and a letter in the door. Once I knew he was safe, I had him send me a picture and I went back to the prosecutor's office and I waited until they finally told me it was gonna be a while and I should just go and someone would call me. I had just gotten home when my phone rang and that was the first time I ever spoke to Mr. Knippen. And he said, Trey is the father. I'm sorry, we thought someone told you. 181 days, five months and 28 days. That's how long after the DNA test we sat wondering. But Skyler knew and didn't tell Trey. She's known from the very beginning it was his. She knew it was his baby. She said it in the first interview and just went on like nothing had happened. In the time between taking the DNA test and where we are today, I've not only watched my son become a totally different person, and I will leave his medical diagnosis private because she's done enough to him, but I can personally tell you I've continuously been seen for depression, panic attacks, anxiety, and sleep issues. And my friends and family will tell you I've become withdrawn, cut off, and a shell of the outgoing person I've always been. It's hard to be around people when you're trying not to lose it in front of anyone and can't talk to people because you don't know who you can trust to keep your son's name away from the media and off social media. I've had multiple babies born into the family and with friends in the last two years. I've avoided gender reveal parties, going to see them at the hospital, first birthday parties. I found multiple excuses not to go over and see them when they were babies. When I was around them, I found myself making excuses, even more excuses not to hold them. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Those that knew what was going on understood. Those that didn't really thought it was odd and knew something was wrong. I love kids, I always have. I'm that mom. My friends, kids all call and talk to me. I've helped raise many of them and consider all of them my own. I would have taken her in with Trey and raised her with no questions asked. You could have gone on to UC and never looked back if that's what she wanted. Her mom and Brandon never had to know. But now instead, every May 7th, I don't get to have a birthday party for my first grandchild. Instead, I get to send her balloons to heaven with notes telling her how much her daddy loves her, how much I love her, how much we all love her, and how much we all wanted her. For Christmas this year, I stayed home. I sent everyone else to do the normal Christmas traditions with our extended family, and then sent them to Southern Kentucky to visit all of my family to do the same things that we always do. But this year, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't stop thinking that this would be the first Christmas that she would love. She would have been into everything. Opening gifts all by herself, getting way too many toys that any child could ever play with, then probably playing with a box. But this would have been that Christmas. Not her first Christmas, but the first Christmas she would have been big enough to enjoy. And then it crushed me. As we live with our grief and loss, she can now live knowing that her selfish decision was not her only choice. She had a way out. Skyler spoke only once during the trial, just prior to sentencing, to which she said she was sorry and that she knows she can be selfish sometimes. Thank you, Your Honor. I would do anything and above that you ask, and I understand. And I just wanted to say how sorry I was. I can sometimes be selfish, but I would like to think that I've become better in the knowledge that I've upset everyone and hurt so many people with what I've done. And I'm forever sorry, and I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm really, really sorry, and I understand, and thank you. First, I want to start by saying I know that many of you watching this are either outraged or feel that the jury got it right. I personally think that the jury got it right. I obviously don't know if Skylar killed Annabelle or if she really was stillborn. None of us were there. No one knows what happened that night except for Skylar. I mean, yes, it's coincidental, but is that enough? And is it really coincidental? Skylar was abusing her body during pregnancy. No prenatal care, she was using laxatives, starving herself. So for me, it's not far-fetched to think that her baby was not healthy. It's also not far-fetched for me to believe that Skylar was out of options and killed Annabelle out of desperation to conceal it from her parents. I want to first address the dynamic that Skylar had with her parents, especially her mother. Kim and Scott come across as these 
these loving parents that are concerned for their daughter and did everything that they could, specifically to treat her eating disorder, which I do find to be true about Scott. He seems very sincere to me and has had his heart ripped apart through this whole deal. I do not find that to be true in regards to Kim. And I know many of you don't either. I honestly tried to give her the benefit of the doubt coming into this. I wanted to believe she was doing her best in a bad situation. But when I saw the text messages between Skylar and Kim on the days leading up to and the days after Skylar gave birth, I absolutely find her behavior repulsive. Even before Skylar gave birth, Kim was texting her about the weight she had put on and pressuring her to lose weight. Saying things like, even your dad has noticed your belly and telling her that she needed to boss up or whatever the fuck. Which is why Skylar continued to brag about her losing weight after giving birth to Annabelle. She was telling her the week leading up to her giving birth, she was gonna lose the weight and she was so happy because she was getting her body back. It wasn't just directly after giving birth that people try to portray. She was telling her mom the things that her mom wanted to hear in order to get praise from her and attention and affection. She basically had to beg for it. And the only time that Kim was satisfied was when Skylar was starving herself. I personally feel that Kim was emotionally and mentally abusing Skylar. Not that that justifies her actions, but I get it. It's abuse to tell your 18 year old daughter to continue using laxatives to lose weight. The media portrays the Richardsons to be all about appearances and to be incredibly vain. I don't find that to be true. Kim is vain. Kim cares about what others think about her family, going as far as to telling Skylar that she's going to jail and panicking about what others are gonna say about them rather than her going to jail. The remark, I thought we had a perfect life is gonna haunt me forever. No one has a perfect life. No one's kids are perfect. No family's perfect. The voice in your children's minds, their self-esteem, their well-being should matter far more than appearances and what other people think about you. I have a daughter and I'm constantly looking for ways to compliment her outside of her appearance. While yes, she's my kid and I think she's beautiful always, I'm always telling her how smart she is, how strong she is, how funny she is, and that I believe she can do anything. Skylar never had that. And I think coming from a dad's perspective, Perspective, that's why I have compassion for her. I'm in no way excusing what she's admitted to or what she allegedly did. Everything in this situation is wrong, and I think people in the right frame of mind, even at 18 years old, would know better than to do this. No normal person would go and bury their baby in the backyard to conceal it, whether she was stillborn or not. But Skylar is not normal. I think that she probably has a lot of psychological issues that we don't know about, and I think she's suffering abuse at the hands of her parents, especially her mom, for ruining her self-esteem and making Skylar's only life goal to be as thin and pretty as possible. Kim only viewed Skylar as valuable when she was talking about her weight loss and how good she looked. Ignoring all the amazing things she did, like volunteering to help kids with disabilities, sit with autistic kids at lunch, graduating with honors, all that mattered is that she was skinny. I know a thing or two about fucked up parenting. And that's just sadistic to me. I think her dad was simply not paying attention to his daughter and let the abuse from his wife slip through the cracks. I've been through something like that and I know how much it can fuck you up. But what kind of world do we live in that a girl would rather allegedly murder her baby than tell her parents at 18 years old that she's pregnant? She went through birth unmedicated alone at 18 years old and then buried her baby in the backyard by herself to avoid telling her parents the truth. That screams poor parenting to me, I'm sorry. If she murdered her baby, I believe it was out of desperation and fear and not because she wanted to continue being a hot cheerleader. I recognize her text message as her happy, happy, happy afterwards, but I genuinely think that that was just to please her mom. Another thing that leads me to believe she was terrified is when the doctor accidentally sent Kim an email about Skylar being pregnant, she texted her and told her that if she was, her life would be over. As far as her saying she loved her body afterwards, people with eating disorders use their disorder as a crutch. They use them to avoid their emotions and to control their lives any way they can. And I think Skylar did just that. She reverted back to her eating disorder and by all accounts, went into complete denial after Annabelle's death. I mean, if you're trying to get away with murder and the only other person in the entire world that knew you were pregnant was at your OBGYN's office, why in the fuck would you go back to that OBGYN, even to see another doctor? How do you guys feel about this case? Do you think that Skylar killed Annabelle? Or do you think it's likely that she was stillborn? Do you think Kim is to blame as well? 
let me know in the comments. And just to address the rumors that are going around on Facebook, there was not dirt found in the baby's lungs. She was decomposed. Her skull was not bashed in. There were no lungs for them to even examine. Her skull was in pieces, but the pathologist testified that that's what they would expect for a newborn at that stage of decomposition. That's normal. That's all I got for you today, guys. Thanks for listening. And as always, remember the name Casey Shane. I'm out.